Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Shift Change, Implementing a Transfer Lock System into Your Lockout Program, sponsored by MasterLock. My name is Kevin Drewley. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for a submit question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today will be Bill Belongi, Safety Services Program Manager at MasterLock. Bill brings nearly 20 years of experience in safety, including in the printing, injection molding, aerospace, construction, and press industries. He uses his expertise to help facilitate to help facility and factory managers worldwide and is a member of the ANSI Z244.1 Standard Committee on the Control of Hazardous Energy, as well as the ANSI Z10 Safety Management Systems Committee. Bill also is a United States Army veteran who served in Operation Joint Guardian in 2000 and Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003 and 2004. Bill, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. All right, Kevin, thanks a lot. I appreciate that introduction. Um, as the uh, program manager for MasterLock, it allows uh, me to uh, uh, visit different organizations throughout the country and witness some best practices that I see and also witness some, some other practices that may not be viewed that way. And I thought today would be a great opportunity to talk about an important topic that doesn't get a lot of publicity or uh, education, so to speak. And that's the shift change aspect of lockout. How are we ensuring that our employees are protected uh, during shift change? Now, when we think of shift, shift change, uh, we automatically think, go oh, at, uh, you know, I work from 7 to 3, and then the next shift comes on at 3 o'clock till uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, whatever the case is. But we also want to think about shift change internally within a shift. If we have multiple workers or multiple crews or crafts that may be transferring lockout uh, during that shift. So not only from one actual physical shift to another, but also within that shift and uh, transferring that and how important that is uh, to uh, take a look at ensuring employee protection and how transfer locks can, can really help us out from this standpoint. We're also going to talk a little bit more uh, later on about uh, group lockout and some of the uh, best practices to, uh, uh, to protect your employees uh, with this critical component. Because this is a critical moment in time, uh, we see here on the picture that gap. We want to make sure that we are protecting our employees and the essence of 1910-147, uh, ensuring that that hazardous energy um, is isolated from one shift to the other or one employee to the other, that we don't have any gaps in that coverage where there could be accidental restarting of that hazardous energy. So it is a critical moment in time that we want to make sure um, employees are protected. So I have a question for everybody, um, just to get a gauge as far as how we're uh, uh, moving through the uh, webcast today. Uh, if you could answer, uh, do you have multiple shifts performing service or maintenance on the same piece of equipment? And if you could click one of those buttons, we'll take a look at the results here in a moment. Eighty percent. 
uh, have uh, multiple shifts performing service and maintenance on the same piece of equipment? 20%? No. Now that's great. So I'm talking to the right audience here. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about some best practices, some ideas that uh, we can uh, send to you and uh, to ensure that, uh, that employees uh, are protected throughout this gap in coverage. Great. Back one slide, excuse me. So we want to define this shift change. And this is something that I want to keep uh, everybody keep in the back of their heads because what we're trying to do is ensure the transition of responsibility of personal lockout devices from the off-going shift to the oncoming shift to ensure that gap in coverage does not exist, that isolation of hazardous energy um, is maintained throughout this gap in coverage. Um, that is one definition that I want us to keep uh, in the back of our head as we as we continue to move through the uh, webcast here. So today we're going to talk a little bit about a background, what motivates us to talk about this, uh, why is this an important talk, topic, some roles and responsibilities. We always like to define roles in our lockout management system, whether that's in a transfer lock system, whether that's in shift change, whatever we're doing throughout our lockout management system, roles and responsibilities are very important. Uh, our lockout policy or our lockout program, how are uh, we going to define this shift change within our organization's uh, lockout program and make sure that that is implemented within our pro policy and program and then train. Um, I also do have something uh, that uh, everybody that uh, is uh, participating today uh, we're going to uh, send is that uh, a shift change permit uh, system. Uh, now, again, yeah, it's a piece of documentation, but it can ensure that accountability uh, for the shift change. We'll talk about that, that a little bit later. And then some action items for you to take uh, with you as uh, we move forward uh, uh, from this webcast. And then we'll have a couple questions and, questions and answers uh, if we have some time. So the background is from our field experience in Master Lock, uh, we're taking a look maybe no more than 10% uh, if employers in the United States have that functioning lockout program uh, that meets uh, all or most of those compliance uh, requirements. They may have um, a couple aspects of uh, lockout uh, covered within their programs or policies or their organization, but they are missing a few items. Um, and then after 27 years of the regulation came out, uh, about 30% of employers currently uh, don't have a significant lockout program in place. Um, and then as we move forward, about 60% of U.S. companies um, have addressed some elements uh, but are still vulnerable to accidents and noncompliance consequences. Um, and this is one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, divulge on. As I spoke earlier, um, I've, allow I've been allowed to, uh, in this position, to visit a lot of organizations and companies and see best practices, not so best practices. Um, I recall uh, about six months ago, I was in an organization that um, had was actually constructing a new building, and they had multiple um, uh, different trades within the facility that were working around the clock to get this facility up and built. They were installing electrical lines. They were installing uh, plumbing uh, fixtures, hydraulic lines, putting in conveyors, um, all sorts of different equipment within this facility. And in a hurry to get that done, multiple contractors, multiple maintenance people within uh, the facility. And as I was walking around witnessing uh, you know, what was going on, there was a lot of opportunity to make sure that uh, the hazardous energy uh, was isolated. And I saw individuals putting locks on taking locks off, and I saw individuals working uh, without locks and with locks. Now, they were coming in and around the clock, shift changes 24-7 going around, and thought, hey, this looks like a great opportunity uh, to implement some sort of organization uh, from a shift change aspect. Um, so uh, when we're talking about the standard here and what we're talking about shift change, uh, we're really digging into 1910-147, the intention of the standard, the um, adherence to that standard. Um, and it primarily focuses on general industry. Um, so the uh, specific standards for marine terminals, longshoring, and construction in industry uh, do have some different uh, um, uh, components and aspects of lockout. Um, 
Uh, but for the most part, 1910-147 really is the standard bearer when we're talking about isolation of hazardous energy and continuity um, of protection for, um, for our employees. So let's dig into this. Uh, shift change. Uh, you have four options within your organization. And one of these is one or more uh, can be implemented within your lockout program or your lockout policy. Uh, your first option. Uh, when we're talking about shift change. And again, remember, uh, this could be from first shift to second shift, or this could be just a change in the shift of uh, those that are working on a particular piece of equipment or maintenance task. Uh, the first one, uh, authorized employees leave their personal lockout devices in place until the job is completed. Uh, maybe they leave after their first shift and they come back the next day and they continue their work. Uh, number two, Oncoming employees, uh, the second shift potentially in this case, uh, apply their personal lockout devices before the offgoing uh, employee remove their personal lockout devices. Now this two is this number two here is very critical. I want us to remember this and keep this also in our minds as we move forward here. Um, your third option: oncoming employee starts lockout from scratch by applying and releasing lockout for the entire time of servicing. Um, equipment is returned to the operational status with guards put back on and the next employee performs lockout on that equipment. So basically ending lockout um, and starting lockout from scratch. And then number four is what uh, is the uh, basis for our uh, conversation today is the use of shift or personnel transfer devices, uh, what OSHA refers to as continuity devices. And we'll take a look uh, here uh, coming up at continuity devices. Now, uh, one of my personal um, uh, things that I like to make sure of whenever I'm um, uh, talking with the group or communicating a lockout is making sure that the nomenclature that we utilize uh, when speaking about these things is consistent. Now, it's consistent from where I'm speaking to uh, um, a webinar or a class or something like that. You just need to make sure that your language and, and nomenclature that you utilize, utilize within your organization is consistent. So when we're talking about continuity, continuity devices, we're looking at a lock or device that is intended to ensure continuity of employee protection during that shift or personnel changes. Now, they're going to be a different color, um, a different, maybe a different type of lockout device. Their intention is not to perform work under them or servicing and maintenance, but to bridge that gap of uh, coverage uh, between shifts. Uh, I hear a lot of job locks, shift transfer devices, uh, job locks, operation locks, production locks. Um, these, in essence, are continuity devices to maintain the isolation of that hazardous energy uh, from a shift to shift. Those job locks or transfer devices are the first lock to be placed on the energy isolation device or the lock box if we're working with a group lock uh, lockout and the last lock to be removed when the job is completed. So that's where we can define operations locks or production locks if you have heard of those before. Um, and they could be identified in general as a group. They don't necessarily have to be individually um, uh, identified, um, but they could be uh, job locks or production locks as maybe from the operations department, the quality department, or the maintenance department. And again, too, um, application and removal of these continuity devices, transfer locks, um, the application or removal can be different uh, authorized uh, employees. The one that put that continuity device on can be different um, that takes that particular continuity device off. Um, just wanted to bring that out. And there may be some questions about that, and we can talk a little bit about that uh, as we move forward here, because I do have an example of, uh, of an actual shift change in how this actually would, would function. Uh, key control in this aspect and understanding key control uh, is very critical within shift change. Um, understanding that personal lock. Um, and uh, individual control uh, over lockout devices uh, constitute a core performance 
of the lockout standard. Now, I hear a lot of uh, uh, customers, uh, individuals uh, ask, well, where does it say in the 1910-147 standard that one lock, one person, one key, where is that in the lockout standard? Well, it doesn't specifically call that out. But for us to comply with the spirit and the essence of the standard, where individual control over lockout devices constitute a core performance, um, there is only one way to comply with that, is to have one person, one lock, one key. Uh, when we are moving uh, forward into continuity devices and transfer locks, um, there is a little bit of difference here. We can have multiple keyed sets uh, with protocol for control by those authorized employees. So we are job transfer locks. There's going to be multiple keys. Multiple owners of those keys uh, are available um, to take off and apply those job uh, production and transfer locks. So let's take a look at an actual shift uh, change here utilizing a continuity device or a transfer lock. So we want to demonstrate from first shift to second shift, ensuring that that gap in coverage um, is maintained with our continuity devices. So we have our first shift. Now, sometimes you may not be afforded the ability to um, put multiple locks on an, is uh, an isolation uh, device where you may have to put a hasp on so it can accept more locks. So this is the scenario that we're going to uh, run with here. So we have a hasp here that has multiple locks on an isolation device. We're ready to lock this particular piece of equipment out um, and, and move forward. So we first put on our transfer lock, our continuity device, um, because we know that this lockout is going to be uh, covering multiple shifts. That lock is on first. We are going through the process of verification of isolation and all of the other particulars that we need to take care of before we're servicing and maintenance. We're making that assumption here with this. So we put the transfer lock, uh, job transfer lock on, and then our first uh, shift then puts their lock on um, because you cannot work or do servicing or maintenance under a job transfer lock um, but only under your personal lock. So we put that first shift lock on, and we're ready to conduct our work. First shift's work is then complete. The second shift is going to come on. So his work may not be done, but he's just extending it into the second shift or third shift in this case. So he removes his lock, the job transfer lock, is still on, it is maintained, that uh, equipment uh, hazardous energy is isolated. So now the second or third shift can now put their personal lock on. However, before they conduct their servicing or maintenance, there's one critical aspect here that we need to take, take into uh, consideration. And that's verifying that that power or that hazardous energy is still off. So before that second or third shift or that change in uh, lockout occurs, that person, that oncoming shift or that oncoming uh, crew uh, still needs to verify that the hazardous energy is isolated. Uh, they should not depend on the actions of others, uh, the offgoing shift, that the hazardous energy has been isolated. So before the, you conduct your work as the second or third shift or the second person uh, that's coming on for this particular lockout, make sure that you are verifying for yourself, because lockout is a personal protection, uh, that that hazardous energy is isolated. So we then move forward, second uh, shift or third shift. Um, their work is done, they continue their servicing maintenance, the work is complete, and now the second or third shift can remove their lock. We still have that transfer lock uh, that is uh, still on that uh, energy isolating device. The 
energy isolating device that is holding the transfer lock is going to have multiple keys. So maybe on each shift you have a designated uh, supervisor or lead that has that key to that particular shift uh, uh, or transfer lock. Uh, now you can take that transfer lock off and you can then come back to normal production operations. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the critical components is to maintain that continuity of uh, isolation of hazardous energy from first shift to second shift or third shift. So we just demonstrated the transfer of control of lockout with a transfer uh, lock um, from a first shift um, to third shift. Group lockout does present some challenges um, when it comes to changing of the guard, so to speak, whether that's the shift or even people coming in and out. Um, I recall a, a situation where um, a, an organization was installing a humongous piece of equipment that had multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, contractors that were coming in, whether it was electricians, um, their maintenance individuals all in there. And this is one of the best practices that I witnessed that uh, I, 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 I like sharing. As they moved through, they had all of their paperwork and permitting systems through there. Each individual that was going to conduct servicing or maintenance on this piece of equipment had their lock, put their lock on the group lockout, uh, signed and documented on the uh, lockout permit that they were there. When they were done with their work, they took their lock off. They signed out. That was a great best practice as we moved in group lockout. So a, uh, a different uh, hierarchy um, comes into play when we're talking about group lockout. And these may be some um, designations that we necessarily have not heard about. Um, these are, again, um, uh, suggestions from 1910-147 on how to organize a group lockout situation. Uh, so we have our primary authorized employee in a group lockout who has that overall responsibility, who are then um, uh, utilize the principal authorized employee and the regular authorized employee. We're going to talk about these here uh, coming up. So in group lockout, the primary authorized employee who's des designated as that um, is the, has the overall responsibility within that group lockout uh, to implement and coordinate that lockout. There's going to be a lot of people coming in and out um, of that particular job. Um, they are going to be the ones that are coordinating um, all of the authorized employees um, and any changes in the affected workforces. Um, they are the ones who have that overall uh, responsibility of continuity protection um, throughout this group lockout. Next, you have your principal authorized employee. So we have our primary authorized employee designated as that, um, who has the overall uh, responsibility within that group lockout. And then we have potentially have uh, multiple crews or crafts that are involved with this lockout. They, each individual crew or craft can have their own leader of that crew, which is then the principal authorized employee. Um, they are designated as that principal authorized employee in charge of their own crew um, or craft, whether it's the electricians, the plumbers, their own maintenance people. They may not maintain accountability um, of their authorized uh, employees in group lockout and, and uh, uh, responsible for that individual exposure of those employees. Um, they coordinate their authorized employees and any affected workers around that area that they are concerned with or working in and around uh, can communicate to the affected uh, workforces as well. Um, they don't remove their group lockout device or tag out mechanism. Uh, from that isolation point until all of their people do. They're the last one. They're the last line of defense. They can verify that their people are off and that uh, they can move forward um, with the uh, servicing or maintenance. And then we have our authorized employees uh, participating in group lockout. Um, they're the authorized employees designated so, um, and they're the ones that are actually affixing their personal lockout device 
uh, to that uh, uh, group lockout device. There's one interesting aspect um, in group lockout um, that uh, we may not think of. And when we're designating in group lockout for the primary authorized employee, the principal authorized employee, and then your designated authorized employees, there's one exception and one caveat. Um, when we have in a group lockout situation, uh, we have a primary and principal authorized employees, they can um, uh, verify for their authorized people that they are responsible for, verification of isolation, verifying that that power is still off. Now, the authorized person who puts their lock on that group lockout still has the right to uh, ensure and verify that that power is off. However, um, the, uh, there is an exception um, in the rule that allows the principal authorized person to verify that that power still is off during any shift change within group lockout uh, before someone puts their lock and tag on that isolating device. We've talked a little bit, or I should say a lot, about uh, continuity devices, um, the actual movement of um, ensuring that gap in coverage um, with uh, transfer and continuity devices. How are we going to capture all that within our lockout policy? Um, and that's the question. Now, um, every organization is different. Um, how you uh, choose to uh, manage your shift change um, is, depends upon how your operations are. And once you determine um, what shift change option is your best uh, route to ensure that gap in coverage um, is, is uh, uh, taken care of, uh, make sure that that is reflected within your policy or your program. If you are going to use transfer locks, continuity devices, job, production locks, call those out. What colors, what types are they going to be? Uh, making sure that that is a, a critical um, uh, uh, inclusion within your uh, lockout policy. Um, are your lockout operations complex? Do you have multiple people that are coming in and coming out? Um, do you have big um, shutdowns of equipment um, with complex lockout procedures? Um, then if that is the case, what is your verification protocol going to be? Are you going to have each authorized uh, employee verify that that power is off? Are you going to uh, implement a hierarchy um, with primary and principal employees in your group lockout settings? Um, if that is the case, um, equipment deployment um, is always uh, one of the things that uh, uh, seems to get uh, uh, missed within this. Um, if you are going to be deploying um, equipment or if you have uh, complex lockout situations, uh, lockout permit uh, stations are a great way to house all the documentation to ensure that continuity of accountability um, is done through your uh, group or complex lockout, as well as potentially mobile uh, group lockboxes, um, and even uh, um, deploying um, your uh, transfer locks. Um, um, where, is they, where are they going to be? Where are the keys for those uh, transfer continuity devices going to be? Remember that the continuity or transfer locks, um, they have multiple keys. There are going to be multiple owners of those keys for those uh, um, uh, those transfer locks, where are they going to be uh, uh, housed? Where are they going to be uh, uh, situated for access um, uh, from that standpoint? Um, do you need to implement a lockout or a shift change permit um, within your policy? That's one of the things that uh, uh, we'll talk about here in the next slide. Take a look at the shift change uh, permit. And then contract agreements. Um, a lot of times when we're talking about shift change, when we're talking about big installations, complex lockout, and even small uh, lockout, um, what is the agreement with your contractor going to be? Uh, making sure that uh, uh, your contractors understand um, your uh, transfer lock process, your protocol, making sure not only do you have that in your policy, but you're communicating that to other authorized employees, such as your contractors, that will be coming within your facility and doing maintenance or uh, uh, servicing on your equipment. Shift change permit system. 
uh, we are living in uh, an age where documentation is so critical uh, to uh, to accountability. Uh, why do we uh, are we required to fill out a document for this, this, and this? And um, making sure that again that accountability aspect um, is complete. Um, if we have any shift change, and this usually works, this shift change permit, more so on simple lockout, um, this is more pertinent to that. However, if you do have complex lockout and you do have lockout permits, implementing this transfer lock uh, permit in here is, a, is also a good idea. Making sure that the offgoing shift and the oncoming shift are having that communication that we are documenting and proving that that gap in coverage between those shifts or those crews or crafts um, with exchanging lockout is done and complete, and we are documenting that that is going on. Uh, so I'll uh, send this uh, document out to everybody um, after the webinar, and they can uh, uh, utilize this um, and maybe shape your own transfer lock permit towards your uh, particular organization. Uh, we see a lot of different types of documents, lockout procedures, permits, things of that nature, making sure that you're tailoring it within the confines of, of 1910-147 to your particular organization. We talked about equipment deployment a little bit, and I'm going to kind of wrap up uh, with this. Um, and equipment deployment is very important. Uh, most uh, likely, if an authorized employee has to walk uh, more than 15 seconds to obtain lockout equipment, the less likely is that they are going to conduct that lockout. Making sure that we have our lockout equipment within um, a reasonable time frame of our uh, employees uh, is very critical. And if we are implementing lockout permits, for implementing a shift change permit, there, are, there is equipment out there um, from a group lockout setting to house some of those documents um, at strategic points within your facility. Mobile group lockout boxes, if you have a uh, lockout that is going on with uh, uh, a, a number of different contractors within your facility, uh, having the ability to move that group lockout box at different points within your facility. And then identifying that continuity device. Um, what type of device, what color device is that going to be? Usually you want to maintain the type of lock that you utilize when you're utilizing a transfer lock system. It's just uh, ensuring that that color of that transfer or continuity device is different and maybe, uh, uh, maybe a, a more um, uh, exaggerated color than maybe a blue or a red lock, maybe a neon green, maybe an orange, uh, maybe a yellow uh, is going to be your transfer lock. So people know when they see that particular color lock that that is a transfer lock, that's a continuity lock, making sure that that iso uh, isolation of hazardous energy is maintained between different shifts, that others have keys to that, um, and that uh, it is utilized within a shift change parameter and no work can be done under the continuity device until a personal lock is put on uh, in conjunction with that transfer lock. So some action items um, as we move forward and then we'll get to some uh, questions and answers um, for the uh, shift change. Uh, determine which best uh, option uh, is for you. We went through the four different options for you, and uh, they may be a com combination of all, combination of both, maybe a transfer lock uh, system utilizing continuity devices to, uh, for that exchange of shift or that exchange of the uh, um, uh, different groups uh, is the right one for you, implementing that uh, transfer lock system. Uh, designating uh, the type and color of the job transfer lock, as we talked about here momentarily ago. Um, updating your lockout policy to reflect that shift change. If you do have a shift change, um, if you do decide to implement transfer lock system, uh, make sure that your policy and your program reflect that, that your employees, your authorized employees, understand uh, what those continuity devices and transfer locks are for, um, and uh, making sure that uh, all your employees um, are uh, trained in that shift change process. Um, 
Are you going to uh, put uh, the shift change policy uh, in your contract or agreement and orientation, uh, ensuring that those contractors understand uh, what your process is uh, for uh, ensuring that gap of uh, coverage uh, between shifts um, is going to be, that they agree with you, that they can maintain that uh, with their uh, work on your site. Um, implementing that shift change permit system, what are the requirements for that particular document? Uh, who is responsible to sign that? Um, usually you could have your primary or principal employees in larger group lockout settings be responsible for that. If you have smaller uh, shift change uh, lockouts, you can have those authorized employees make that exchange um, and annotate that uh, 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 shift change on that permit system and then house those documents uh, for your records uh, for time after that. And then necessary equipment. Where are we deploying our permit uh, stations, our group lock boxes? Um, our padlocks, all of our lockout devices, um, they need to be strategically placed throughout the facility. And that can be in your program and policy too, and uh, trained throughout uh, all of your employees um, with this. So uh, those are some action items that I think we can take uh, moving forward, uh, taking a look at um, our particular organization, um, how much shift change goes on. Do we need to put that transfer lock on before we start that lockout? in anticipation that it's going to bleed into that next shift, that the next shift is going to have it. If we do, that transfer lock ensures that continuity of protection between uh, your first and second shift. So, we have time for questions. Yes, we do. No, uh, excellent. Great job, Bill. Thanks for your insights and expertise. Before we do start the Q&A, just want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now. Your input is important because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. Um, on the opposite part of that screen, that lower left-hand part, also want to direct you to the resources widget. Um, Bill's provided some additional information that may be of use to you. So again, that's on the lower left-hand corner of your screen in the resources widget. And with that, let's get to some questions. First, can you have a master key for all locks that one person in the plant can use to unlock a lock if all requirements are met for lockout tagout, such as trying to get a hold of the person who applied the lock or someone who went home sick, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, we have to take a look at uh, what is the uh, essence in the spirit of what 1910-147 is asking us. Um, you can have a master key. However, if you are going to utilize that protocol and that process to have a master key in the event you cannot get anybody, um, you know, if someone went home sick or something, uh, you know, banded lock, so to speak, um, that is okay. If you have that um, uh, protocol uh, trained, and stated within your lockout policy, and you can hold your organization or yourself accountable to having that master key, yes, you can do that. Next question, does this mean the transfer lock goes on at the start of shift one? Yes, the transfer lock, if you anticipate that a shift change will occur during this lockout, you can put that transfer lock on uh, at the beginning or first before you put your lock, your personal lock on. If throughout the shift you know that you didn't intend at first that that was going to bleed into the next shift, you can put that transfer lock on before you take your personal lock off, and then that uh, second shift can then put their lock on um, or that transfer lock currently uh, resides. Our next question, if using the multi-hasp, do you have to use the transfer lock, or as long as the oncoming shift adds theirs first before the off, before the off-going shift removes theirs, is that acceptable? That is absolutely acceptable. That's one of your options that you can, uh, uh, that you can uh, work into if you have uh, uh, multiple shifts. Yes. Next one, who has the key to the transfer lock? Uh, the key to the transfer lock is usually, I would say most of the time, um, designated how you see fit. 
Uh, most of the times where I've seen it, where I've um, uh, had ownership of lockout management uh, in different facilities, is that the uh, production supervisor of that shift has ownership of that lock. Um, someone who is designated maybe a lead on that shift, the person that has that key, whether it's the production supervisor or the lead, those individuals also need to be authorized employees as well. It can't be just um, a supervisor who is not authorized. So they also need to be authorized um, if they have that uh, ownership of that key. It's whoever you designate as that responsible party on that particular shift um, uh, to have ownership of that transfer lock. And one of the nice things, too, about uh, implementing a, a transfer lock system is you would have, it would really, in essence, um, avoid any abandoned lock situations. Because once that person left, they're going to take their lock off. And you have that transfer lock on that a supervisor has a key to um, until that second shift comes on. So in the event you have to start that piece of equipment up, um, uh, you can uh, simply take that transfer lock off and get that piece of equipment back running. Next one, who has the authority to use the block cutters on a personal lock if the employee, for example, if the employee will not be available or is on vacation? Uh, that is however you designate that um, has the uh, authority to do uh, to cut that lock off. Again, remember, if you are going to be cutting any lockout devices off in isolation point, um, you need to ensure that you have that documentation trail uh, to, to uh, uh, prove that you lo uh, cut that lock off. In addition to informing that employee's lo uh, the employee that put that lock on, that that lock is off and that piece of equipment is no longer safe to uh, uh, go into. Next one is a little bit of a blend. It's an observation and, and then a question. Uh, mm -hmm. It says that having, having a continuity device is a great idea, uh, but having three levels, uh, primary, principal, and authorized, is cumbersome. Uh, they mm -hmm. say, I would, think that, I, I would think that would help your sales, but is it required? Um, it's, it's not a requirement. But when you dig deep into um, OSHA's uh, um, expansion of 1910-147, you will then see the explanation of, of the primary principal employees where they have that, that uh, overall responsibility. And usually when you're doing uh, the principal or primary employees, um, those are in big group lock uh, lockout situations. Uh, so you wouldn't necessarily have that on smaller um, smaller uh, um, uh, group lockouts, but something that is a massive situation where you want to have that additional accountability so you know who is the leader of this group lockout, who is the leader of my crew within that group lockout. So those are two designations that OSHA does expand on um, that is a, a suggestion uh, to ensure that uh, continuity and that accountability through a uh, um, group lockout. Next question. What if I know that I will be the only one working on the piece of equipment the next day after my shift ends? Why would I have to put a transfer lock on the isolation point? Uh, you don't have to. Uh, but one of the aspects, and I've, I've seen this many times and I've been involved in this, where um, we didn't necessarily think that um, there was going to be any need to run that piece of equipment. Uh, but um, after uh, that first shift employee leaves and their lock is still on there, uh, at 10 o'clock at night, we needed to get that piece of equipment running, but his lock was on there. We had to go through the abandoned lock protocol. But because you put a transfer lock on that a supervisor has the key to, uh, they can simply take that lock off um, and you can get that piece of equipment running. Next one. Uh, it's not. It's, yeah, uh, well, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry go Kevin. Ahead. No, go ahead, Bill. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, I was just going to say it's not a requirement. It is a best practice to implement these transfer locks uh, to ensure that continuity um, as you move move through uh, uh, different shifts. Go ahead, Kevin. Sorry about that. Oh, no, you're, you're quite all right. Um, next one is asking, uh, what are your thoughts on using numbered car seals on the group lock box at the start of the permitting process so that subsequent maintenance shifts don't have to rewalk the lockout and isolation devices for each shift? Um, that 
that's an interesting question, and there's there's a lot there. Can you repeat that question just so I can absorb absorb that again? There's a couple of things. Absolutely. So yeah. it's asking what are your what are your thoughts on using numbered car seals on the group lockbox at the start of the permitting permitting process, so that subsequent maintenance shifts don't have to rewalk the lockout and isolation devices each shift. And and again too, as as we were talking about um, in these group lockout situations. Um, you can designate that principal employee to verify um, walking through um, that that isolation hazardous isolation um, of of that uh, uh, power um, is complete. So um, that's a little bit more um, uh, detailed um, of a question and more of a scenario uh, situation where we go back to the essence of. Uh, what we've been talking about is, are we ensuring that gap in coverage? Am I protecting my employee uh, by ensuring that they have that personal protection? Are we affording them the right to verify that the power is off? Um, if this is the system that you have gone with and you can ensure that you are complying with those uh, particular standards, yes, that is okay. Okay, and this, this one, I, I think I think you've tackled it, but this is a sort of a related question that came in. Is a numbered mm -hmm. seal with documentation tag sufficient for continuity on a lockbox? Yes, it is. And you have to, um, when we're talking about more uh, tagging situations as, a, as uh, opposed to lockable devices, um, the same principles apply, but you need to maintain uh, that continuity and how you are organizing um, those particular um, uh, devices uh, with the continuity. So, yes. Okay. Um, well, no, we'll, we'll keep getting you questions for sure, but just want to remind folks that if you would like to ask Bill a question, you're welcome to. There's a question and answer uh, button at the, the lower left uh, part of your screen. You, you'll see that. You'll type your question, click Submit Question, and it'll, it'll come over to us on the other side. So uh, next question now, what, if, what do I do if I didn't anticipate the servicing or maintenance task to go over one shift and I didn't put a transfer lock prior to beginning the lockout? Um, that's okay because you can put, and, and this is, we're making the assumption in this scenario that you have either an isolation device or a hasp on that accepts multiple locks. And if you did not anticipate that, but it is going to happen, you can put that transfer lock on before you, um, uh, before you take that personal lock off. And one of the other things too, is, is I didn't get into this, uh, in, into the uh, uh, nuts and bolts within the presentation, but when we're talking about, uh, transfer and continuity device. Now, I don't want to get, get confusing, but um, I have seen uh, uh, organizations utilize combination locks as their continuity devices. Um, there is ability for different types of locks to be used. Um, maybe a Bluetooth type lock could be something that can be used as a continuity device. Remember um, that the continuity device, you're not conducting any servicing or maintenance under that, so no work is going on until you have that personal lock that only is a, uh, a one key for that particular authorized person. Next question says, you were showing locks. Where are the tags? Uh, the uh, for for the locks, uh, thanks. Thank you for that particular question. Uh, when you are putting on a lock, um, the lock needs to be identified as who owns the lock. Um, who does that lock go to? And signifying, um, uh, you know, do, you know, danger. Do not uh, remove. Um, a tag um, does not need to be accompanied with a lock um, unless you need to. Um, I guess maybe I'm saying this a, a, a little bit uh, wrong. Um, you don't need a tag if that lock is identified. I'm making the assumption that we have that person's name on that lock, and that's when you don't need that accompanying tag. I hope that answered your question. Um, well, again, not to, not to be uh, repetitive, folks, but no, if, if you do want to send a, a question, to, we have time for some more. And again, it's the, the lower left part of your screen. And type your question, click Submit Question, and we will ask it here on the webcast. So next
next one now. Kevin, uh, yeah, you... Kevin, I just want to. Oh, go. Oh, I just wanted to maybe expand a little bit on 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 what I would just what I just said. Um, we can't. We don't want to get lockout and tagout confused. We hear a lot about lockout tagout. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that a lock and a tag needs to be on that isolation point. That lock needs to be identified with that person's name, maybe a picture on there. They can be engraved um, having those that person's name so you know whose lock that is. That is the whole point of an actual tag when it is used with a lock. Um, and then we have tag out, where tag out has different requirements. Tag out um, um, also is accompanying secondary measures of uh, isolation and safety measures. Uh, and is different from lockout. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, next question now. Can you use a tag only? Uh, yes. Yeah, you can. There are tagging um, uh, continuity devices. Absolutely, yes. Um, the And when you're looking at uh, the tag uh, tag out continuity devices, um, there are uh, different methods that are used um, similar to locks, almost in a group tag out uh, uh, device um, or kind of a group tag uh, lock box, so to speak. Um, uh, but yes, it's a very similar process using tag out, um, but there are some additional protections and verifications and additional uh, uh, accountability that you want to make if you are doing this within a tagging situation. Again, tag out is a is a kind of a whole different uh, other animal than lockout due to the ability for you to actually um, um, activate isolation devices because locks are there to ensure that you can't. So yes, you can. Um, if you are going to utilize um, a tagging a continuity device methodology or, or transfer system, uh, please do look into the uh, uh, OSHA uh, CPL a little bit further for uh, uh, additional guidance on that. Does the continuity device need a tag? Uh, no. Nope, same principle with as long as that um, uh, is identified. Again, it could be um, a, uh, uh, designated as a group. Maybe it's the maintenance department. Uh, maybe it is Joe Smith's lock. If that lock is either engraved with that person's name um, or uh, uh, has some sort of identifier on that lock, you do not need an accompanying tag. All right. Sounds like you and the attendees are on a good wavelength. You, you mentioned the, the example of the Joe Smith lock. This next one asks, should locks be engraved with full name or initials for identification? Um, I would say yes. Um, I think that is a best practice. Um, you don't have to worry about tags. Um, you know whose lock that is. Um, so yes, that is a, a good uh, way to uh, ensure that identification um, of that lock. Absolutely. Do you need a transfer with, lock if you? Go ahead, Kevin. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, oh, I was going to say full uh, name, full name or initials okay. for engraving. Do you need a transfer lock if you use a hasp and can have a lock put on from the second shift and then the first shift taking it off? All right, say that one more time. <laughs> oh sure. Do you need a transfer lock if you use a hasp and can have a lock put on from the second shift and then the first shift? takes it off uh, yes you would you would want to utilize that oh if, if you're just making that exchange from the first to second shift in real time no you do not need to add um, add in that transfer lock so if you're having that that exchange at that time no you do not need to add that transfer lock all right well you've you've been quite thorough today Bill is there anything left unsaid or any Closing thoughts to to give the folks here today. No, I I I think you know again this is a topic that you, you don't hear a lot about, you don't see a lot about, but there, it, it is a, an important part, an important time frame um, in lockout. Um, you don't want to leave a piece of equipment that has hazardous energy um, have the ability for someone to turn that on, to have um, that gap in coverage uh, um, open. 
uh, for potential uh, incident. We want to make sure that the continuity uh, continues throughout those shifts. Um, so if you, have, if you have any further questions, please reach out and uh, I will get those answered. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, no, we, we thank you. And uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to our speaker, as Bill indicates. Once again, hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen and give us your feedback. Uh, that ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Bill Belanger, everyone at Master Lock, and all of you who listened in. Thanks, and have a great day.